Hey guys, so welcome back to a new hands-on video by Miro Lessons and today I'm here with the two new Zeiss Batiste. These two lenses are the second family of lenses designed exclusively for the Sony full frame system by Zeiss. And unlike the Loxia lenses, the Batiste lenses have autofocus and the 85mm also has optical stabilization. Also, unlike the Loxia lenses, uh, these two new Batiste lenses are two different focal lengths that we haven't seen yet on the Sony's full frame system. We have a 25mm f2 and we have an 85mm, which is the first native portrait lens for the system. As you can see, the lenses are very simple design. They're actually very similar to the 2.8 lenses that Zeiss designed for the Fujifilm and Sony APS-C system. I find the design well conceived. It's elegant, it's minimalistic. Both lenses have a rubber focusing ring, which is very pleasant to use. And also being rubber, it means that you can use them in cold environment, even without gloves, and you won't feel the cold from the metal surface. Of course, one of the downsides is that the rubber attracts more dust. It's focused by wire, it's not mechanical focusing, but still the focusing ring is smooth and nice to use. But perhaps the most interesting characteristic of these two new lenses is the OLED screen. Uh, instead of the traditional markings uh, for the distance and depth of field you find on many manual focus lenses, Zeiss opted for an OLED screen that will show you electronically the distance you're focusing in and your depth of field. When you are in autofocus mode, uh, basically the OLED screen remains off. Uh, the only time you will see it activated is when you turn on the camera, the Zeiss name will appear briefly. But when you go into manual focus, it will automatically activate so let's see a practical example. Uh, so I'm gonna set my focusing distance at four meters, as you can see. I have an f4 aperture right now. So basically the lens is telling me that between 2.6 and nine meters, everything is in focus. That's my depth of field. And at the center four meters, that's my precise focusing distance. If I increase my aperture, let's say I'm going to f11, you will notice that the depth of field increased as well. And now between 1.6 and infinity, everything is in focus. Then if I also increase my focusing distance to infinity, then I know that between infinity and 2.5 meters, everything is in focus at f11. So that's basically a digital version of the distance scale you normally find on manual focus lenses. So right now my distance unit is in meters, but if I wanted to change it to feet, uh, I can simply use the focusing ring. What I need to do is to uh, go to the shortest distance. And once I'm reaching the shortest distance, I have this arrow on the left that will indicate the closest distance available. If I keep turning the focusing ring for 360 degrees, at a certain point, from meters, I change to feet. If I want to switch back to meters, I just repeat the same operation. I'm turning it in at 360 degrees and I'm back to meters. In a similar way, I can also decide to activate the OLED screen also when I'm in autofocus with the camera or to deactivate it completely in both manual and autofocus mode. Uh, this time I'm going to turn the focusing ring in the opposite direction until I reach infinity. And as you can see, there is an arrow on the right. Then I keep turning for 360 degrees and then I can choose between on, MF and off. I simply keep turning the focusing ring until the right setting I want is selected. It is a little bit annoying, but it works and once the right option is selected, you simply turn it the other way. And in this case, the OLED screen is turned off. I'm repeating the same annoying turning and then I can choose again to activate it or activate it only when I'm in manual focus. 
on a personal level, the only time I found this OLED screen really useful is uh, for some night shots. I took some shots of the Milky Way and of course it was midnight, it was pitch dark and it was really easy to use the OLED screen to focus to infinity. However, during daylight, it's more difficult to see if you want to work in manual focus. You have to tilt and find a, an appropriate angle to uh, detect better the information the screen is giving you. So, I mean, there's a positive side and a less positive side, but I mean, it's a nice feature, so I'm sure that some of you will appreciate it, but I also think that some photographers will probably miss a more traditional distance scale. So what about optical quality? So let's start with the 25. Now the 25, it's a f2 wide angle lens. So of course it's a very fast aperture lens. The sharpness is really excellent, uh, even f2 and even at the corners, I really find this uh, lens to be really, really, really good when it comes to sharpness, when it comes to details, even on the A7R. If you manage to focus close to uh, an object, you can, you can also get a very nice okay rendering. So overall, a very good performance. There are two negative points. The first one is vignetting. Vignetting can be quite severe, especially on the A7R. On the A7S, it's uh, less pronounced. And I also find some trace of chromatic aberration, even at 5.6. It's not a big deal because uh, both chromatic aberration and vignette can be easily removable in Lightroom, but it's certainly something to mention. But otherwise, very good, a very good lens, and I think that it can be useful for many applications. Uh, astrophotography, of course, because it's F2 lens, wedding events, or every situation where uh, you don't have a lot of light. The 85 mm also provides very good sharpness, even at f1.8. Uh, it's very sharp, very nice details, even on the A7R. I really like the bokeh and autofocus rendering as well. I find it to have a very natural rendering. I really like the smooth transition between the focus point and the autofocus area of your image. So overall, a very good portrait lens. Uh, there is some slight vignetting as well at 1.8, but already at 2.8 it's gone. I didn't find any relevant trace of chromatic aberration. So, I mean, that's a very, very good portrait lens in my opinion. Perhaps the only downside about the 85 mm uh, it's expensive. I mean, actually both Batiste lenses are expensive. Uh, they cost more than $1,000. But in the case of the 85, usually uh, on the DSLR system, an 85 mm 1.8 is the affordable option for portraits. Uh, you can find the lenses around $400, $500 from both Canon and Nikon. This Zeiss Batiste costs way more. It's double the price. Is it worth it? Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, if you like the Zeiss rendering, the Zeiss character, uh, that's certainly a true Zeiss lens. Uh, personally, I really like it. Right now, it's the only native portrait lens for the Sony full frame system, so I would recommend it especially to portrait photographers. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, both lenses have autofocus. I found them fast on the A7R, the A7S. Uh, we also used the 85mm on the A6000 for sports photography, and it performed really well. The 85mm also have optical stabilization, uh, it works quite well. I could take some uh, sharp images at 1 15, 1 10 of a second. What about the Zeiss? Well, uh, the 25mm is not bad, actually I find it very comfortable to use and I find the grip very well balanced on the A7 series but also the A6000. The 85mm is larger and heavier as well. Of course, the lens hood makes it look bigger than it actually is, but for my own personal use, this is the limit I would consider uh, when it comes to size and weight for the A7. It's nice, but everything bigger than that uh, becomes less portable, less compact, and that's what I like about mirrorless cameras. So that's it for this hands-on video about the Batiste lenses. I hope you enjoyed it. As usual, feel free to leave a comment on this very YouTube video, also to check out our reviews about the Batiste lenses. Thank you for watching and see you soon. Bye-bye.